Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name is Erin and I am the founder of the Metronidazole Toxicity Support Group on Facebook. I am also the creator of the Metronidazole Toxicity blog. You can find the links to both of them in the description below. And today we're going to be talking about the symptoms of metronidazole toxicity. On the surface, this would seem like a really simple video, but the truth is nothing is simple when it comes to metronidazole toxicity. We really need to break down these symptoms to have a better understanding of what they're like for the people who are suffering from this, their loved ones, and any healthcare expert who might be listening. So for this list, we are going to be going through the most common to the least common symptoms of this toxicity. This list is based off of medical literature, the FDA label, the FDA report, patient reviews, and then the testimony of the hundreds of patients that I've spoken with dealing with this toxicity, including my own experience. However, despite all of that, this list is still subjective. If you think that there is a symptom that is more common than where I've placed it, that's perfectly okay. Next, I want to point out that just because a symptom is listed as a less common symptom doesn't mean that it's less important. In fact, one of the symptoms that I experienced during my initial reaction is one of the less common symptoms, so don't worry about that. It doesn't devalue it. And lastly, I want to point out that I might have missed something. Maybe there's a symptom that you experienced that's not on this list. Maybe there's a different way that you experienced the symptom that I'm describing. If so, please feel free to leave that information in the comments below. There is one more thing that I want to say before we get started on this list. For somebody who is new to metronidazole toxicity and they didn't realize anything about metronidazole toxicity before this point, this list can look a little scary. Just because there is a long list, and it is long, doesn't mean that you're going to have all of these symptoms. But I believe that it's important for people to know what is going on with their bodies. And to be in the dark about it, I think, is far scarier than knowing what is really going on. Okay, so let's get started. So this first page is the most common symptoms of metronidazole toxicity. And at the top of that list is anxiety. Now this anxiety is not like any anxiety that you have probably ever experienced. This is nonstop panic attacks. It's also adrenaline rushes that go through your body every 30 seconds to two to three minutes. It is literally a lowering of your stress threshold where you can't handle any stress and any stimuli. There is a reason why this is the most common symptom and we're going to get into that into the second part of this video series. But for right now, just know that this is the most common symptom when you have that big initial reaction. The next symptom on this list, ironically, paradoxically, is fatigue. Now, when people think of fatigue, what they think of is sleepiness. This is not sleepiness. Fatigue is where your body is literally out of energy. And what it feels like, the closest thing that I can compare it to is when you've had something like the flu and you are a couple of days out from it, but you still feel that malaise feeling, you still feel that sickly feeling where you walk down a flight of stairs and it absolutely exhausts you. You might notice with your metronidazole toxicity that taking a shower is now a very laborious task. Your body doesn't have any energy and it's something that sleep will not cure. The next symptom is dizziness. Now this one is pretty self-explanatory. And you might have had a little bit of dizziness prior to your big toxicity moment, but the dizziness you feel after that is, is much greater. Headaches, again, it's not as simple with metronidazole toxicity as it is with other things. It's not just a headache, and it can be a, a mild headache or it could be as bad as a migraine. But with this headache, you also have this very strange head pressure sensation. It feels like your brain is too big for your skull. The next symptom is nausea. Now, as a side effect, nausea is probably the most common metronidazole side effect. 
But the difference between an adverse reaction with nausea versus a side effect is that when you stop taking the drug, the nausea typically goes away. When it comes to having this toxicity, the nausea remains to some extent. The next one is anorexia. And I know that's a little weird seeing anorexia when we typically consider that a psychological disorder. But in this particular case, anorexia is actually listed on the FDA label for metronidazole as an adverse reaction, and there's a good reason for it. This goes beyond you losing your appetite. You have lost the will to eat. You are never hungry. You never have the desire to eat, and everything in your body tells you not to eat. Of course, with this symptom, you're going to have weight loss. It is very common for someone with metronidazole toxicity to lose 10 to 30 pounds within the first four to six weeks of their toxicity symptoms. The next symptom is brain fog. And again, this term just doesn't really cut it when it comes to explaining what is going on with a person suffering from this toxicity. This goes beyond just being a little cloudy. You have difficulty concentrating, you feel spaced out all the time, your head feels druggy. In fact, this symptom was so bad for me that when it started to improve, that is when I was able to go back to work full time. That's how bad it was. You're literally shaking your head constantly like your brain is an extra sketch that you're trying to clear and it doesn't clear. In addition to this difficulty concentrating, forgetfulness, cloudy thinking, druggy feeling, you also have, um, it can also cause your vision to be a, a little blurry because you've lost the ability to really focus on things and focus on your surroundings. Next is obsessive thoughts. Your brain just will not quiet. Now this goes back to the anxiety, of course, but it's not just that your brain won't quiet, but the voice in your head doesn't sound like you. You no longer feel like yourself anymore. The thoughts that you're having don't resemble the person that you know yourself to be. And on top of that, you cannot get it to be quiet. Next is insomnia. Of course, if you're having this type of anxiety, brain fog, obsessive thoughts that will not quiet, it just makes natural sense that you're going to have insomnia. But again, this insomnia is not like anything you've experienced before. For a lot of people, they can only sleep a couple hours a night. And what a lot of times it looks like, especially at the beginning of the night, but it could go through the entire night, is that you start to relax, you start to doze off a little bit despite all the anxiety in your body. And then after about 20 or so minutes, you <gasps> jolt awake. You might even sit up in bed and you're breathing in this heavy amount of breath and your heart is racing in your chest and the brain fog and the dizziness is just, is just going through your brain. You might feel the head pressure more. And then when you try to doze off again, you have the same exact problem. And this can, again, go through the first part of the night or the entire night, depending on the person suffering from this. The next is depression. Depression can be a symptom of metronidazole toxicity all on its own. But a lot of the times what happens is that the person doesn't have depression when they're taking the medication. They have anxiety, they have the head pressure, they have the obsessive thoughts, but they think that once they stop taking the medication, all of these symptoms are going to go away. And when they don't, and then it keeps on going for the next couple of weeks, this can easily lead to depression. It's also very common for people to have emotional instability with metronidazole toxicity on top of everything else. So it's very easy to fall into depression when you're dealing with all of these symptoms. And a lot of times it's a delayed symptom because of that, but not always. Metronidazole toxicity can cause depression all on its own. And we will explain in the next video why that is. Okay. Now we go to the next column and it's nightmares. If you're having this type of anxiety, it's very common to have nightmares and or vivid dreams. The next one is constipation or diarrhea. It's usually one extreme or the other. And again, in the next video, we're going to talk about the reasons why that is. Heart palpitations. 
it's not just that your heart is racing in your chest. These heartbeats, even if your heart isn't necessarily racing, the beat itself is extremely hard against your chest. It feels almost like your heart is trying to break your ribs and you can feel your heartbeat in your chest, the temples in your head, pretty much everywhere. It is that strong. So even if you don't have a racing heart and most people do, you will still have that hard heartbeat. Changes in blood pressure. Again, it's one extreme or the other. You're either going to have higher blood pressure or lower blood pressure. In my case, mine was abnormally low, despite all the anxiety. Next is difficulty breathing. You might notice that you're air hungry. You might notice that you are holding your breath. So let's say that you're sitting and watching television or you're at the computer and all of a sudden you feel a little uncomfortable and then you realize that you haven't taken a breath in 10, 20 seconds. And it's only when you become uncomfortable that you realize that you need to breathe. It literally feels like your lungs have been put on manual control. On top of that, anytime that you try to do any mild physical exertion, you can be very air hungry and short of breath. It literally feels like your brain and your lungs are out of sync. Metallic taste in your mouth. Again, this is a side effect that can turn into an adverse reaction because as a side effect, metallic taste is not a big deal for most people. They take the drug, they might have this metallic taste, I did, and then after they stop taking the drug, the metallic taste goes away. With metronidazole toxicity, for some people, that metallic taste can potentially continue. That's actually a little less common, but considering how common it is as a side effect, I decided to go ahead and put it on the first page. Next is difficulty walking or weakness in your legs. Now the fatigue, like I said before, is going to cause you to completely lose energy in your body. And this includes horrible weakness throughout your body. But you might notice that you have more weakness in your legs. In addition to that, you might find that your walking is uncoordinated, that you're, you're walking with a little bit of a wider gait. And so gait is the, the manner to which you walk. It's not just a matter of having this weakness in your legs, but also that you find that you're stumbling a little bit or you feel unsteady on your feet. It, again, feels like your brain and your legs are not coordinating with one another. And lastly, for this page, we have burning and or tingling in the hands and feet. Now, burning isn't really necessarily the best description for this. That's what's listed in medical literature, but the truth is it's more like an electrical sensation. It's more like an electrical burning instead of a, a, like a fire burning. And that typically, if, it's, if it happens, will typically start in the feet and then quickly go to the hands. It might also be possible that this can cause numbness. Okay, so now we're going on to the next page of the second most common symptoms of metronidazole toxicity. And the first one on the list is actually sometimes a delayed symptom. And this is neck pain and or stiff neck. So what will happen sometimes is, and it can happen when you're taking the drug, but a lot of times this symptom can start a week to four weeks after you've taken the drug. And typically the pain will be at the base of your skull and radiate downwards. The stiff neck will cause your neck to be very difficult to uh, have appropriate range of motion. And then in addition to that, you might also have a weak neck. So I, I call this the bobblehead effect. And, and basically what it is, is it feels like your, your head is too heavy for your neck to support. The next one is tremors. It's been my personal experience that it's more likely to have the tremors in your arms and your hands than in your legs. But what it'll be is this little bit of a jitter kind of sensation, this unsteadiness in your limbs. And what you might feel is what's called an internal tremor where you just feel like your arms and your, and your hands are a bit unsteady. But if it gets to an extreme point, you might notice that your, your hands are trembling. And I actually have a video of that with me that I will share in the next video of this series. Changes in vision. 
We already talked about a little bit how brain fog can change the, your ability to, to focus on things. But in addition to that, um, metronidazole can directly cause you to have blurry vision. That is a possibility. The next is called derealization and depersonalization. Now this one needs a little bit of explaining, but pretty much what it is, and again, it's related to the brain fog, is that you feel detached from either your surroundings, which is derealization, or your body, which is depersonalization. You know that you're sitting in the room, but the room itself doesn't feel real. You feel detached from it. It feels not necessarily far away from you, but it feels sort of fake. It doesn't feel right. And with depersonalization, that is one I did not experience. A lot of people describe it as a bit of an out-of-body experience where you don't feel connected to your body anymore. Mental confusion, that doesn't really require a whole bunch of explanation. You are obviously confused at this point. There's a lot of, of difference between the emotional instability and the um, brain fog and all these other things going on. It's very easy to get confused. The next is paranoia, obviously. Um, I actually had this myself. At one point, there was a man who cut me off in while I was driving in my vehicle and stopped in the middle of the road, rolled down his window, and I guess he cursed me out. I'm not really sure because I never bothered rolling down my window to hear it. But then he didn't move. He just sat there in the road. And of course, even normal me, no, no metronide is all required, I would, this would be scary. And so I immediately turned into an intersecting road onto the right and noticed that he wasn't following me. At this point, normal me would have been like, fine, great, he was a jerk, whatever. Because of my paranoid state, my brain started racing. It started to think, well, what happens if he's waiting for me on the main road? And what happens if he finds out where I live and comes to my apartment and murders me? I was really thinking this. And the logical part of my brain told me that that was nonsense. He wasn't following me. He wasn't tracking me. He wasn't going to hunt me down. But that's how I felt. I felt like he was trying to find me to murder me. And when I got home, I was so scared that I... I locked my doors, I, I went to my, my bedroom, and my bedroom lock was, was broken. I lived there for four years, I never tried to bother locking it before. And so I grabbed a electric keyboard piano that I had in storage, and I shoved it underneath my doorknob in order to jam the door so nobody could get in. That is not something a normal person would do, but that's how I felt at the time. And the logical part of my brain told me that it was not right, but I could not shake the emotional part of it. So paranoia, and it is a very common symptom. The next one is burning and or tingling in the face, arms, and legs. So now this has gone beyond the feet and the hands. This has now progressed to the face, which is the next most hit region, and then the actual total extremities. And again, this goes into the burning being more like an electrical type of burning, tingling, and it could also potentially be a numbing sensation as well. It could be numbness. Temperature deregulation. You might notice, again, one extreme or the other. You might notice that you are really hot or you are really cold. And in some cases, like myself, you might notice that you're both. In my case, I felt like my face was on fire. I went to bed every single night with a wet washcloth and ice on my forehead, but my body would be shivering cold. Frequent urination. This could be partly related to the anxiety, the amount of anxiety you're having, everything's overstimulated, including your bladder, but there's other mechanisms involved that we're gonna talk about in the next video. Brain zaps. You might notice an electrical sensation in your head especially when you're trying to sleep, especially when you have that jolt awake moment. And it feels uh, many times like a wave of electricity going from the back to the front or from the sides. And um, it can go on potentially all night. 
Um, I'll tell you right now that this is actually not considered a dangerous symptom. When I had it, I, I honestly thought that I might be dying. Uh, I didn't know what was going on. It was very scary. I've looked it up. I've researched it since then. It's actually a benign symptom, but it is, um, it's very uncomfortable. It's, and it's very scary. Light and or sound sensitivity. So this is actually called photosensitivity or phonosensitivity. And there are some people I know of who have metronidazole toxicity where they have to wear sunglasses inside. For me, I had sound sensitivity and it was where my, my family's obnoxiously loud. Even my brother's loud voice, I would have to leave the room because it would just, it would, it would cause adrenaline rushes. It would cause adrenaline to rush into my body, listening to him try to talk. Same thing with a loud television and I couldn't stand it and I'd have to leave the room. Muscle twitches. You might notice these more in the legs, but they can be anywhere. Muscle aches. Uh, this is in part, can be in part due to the anxiety, but there's other things going on that can cause the muscle aches. And again, it's typically going to be in the extremities, the arms and the legs, but it could potentially be anywhere. Dry mouth. Of all the things in the world, right? You can have a dry mouth with metronidazole toxicity where you just aren't producing enough saliva. And uh, there's other things that can be involved in that, but it can be a little uncomfortable. Sore throat. It's also related to the dry mouth, but also you can have a sore throat as a consequence of all the anxiety and the adrenaline you're going through because when you have that much adrenaline rushing through your body, it's going to dilate your airway. And that's great if you're running away from a tiger, but it's not so great when it's going on for weeks or even a few months. It can cause the air to hit the back of your sinus cavity and your throat and cause a lot of irritation that can eventually lead to a sore throat. Ringing in the ears. This is a symptom that I have and, and it's exactly how it sounds. You have this, this mild ringing in your ears. Uh, from what I've understood, uh, and please if leave in the comments below if I'm wrong, I don't know anyone who's had hearing loss due to metronidazole toxicity, but I know a lot of people who have ringing in their ears. Heat intolerance. You can also have cold intolerance, but typically with metronidazole toxicity, it's more likely for you to have a heat intolerance. And it could be where you go out and it's warm out during the summertime and your symptoms all flare up as you're outside. Or it could be where you go outside and you feel fine. You might um, go for a walk in the summer heat. And then as soon as you get home and close the door and you have that chill of the AC hit you, all of a sudden you crash. That is also heat intolerance. It's going from one extreme to another, from the cold of the inside to the hot of the outside to the cold of the inside again. Exercise intolerance. Obviously, if you have this much fatigue and all these other problems, then exercise is going to be incredibly difficult, even if you were an athlete before this. I really don't recommend anybody trying to get into um, a, a lot of physical exertion at the beginning part of this and pushing themselves too hard. But if you do that, what you will probably notice is that while you're exercising, you might feel fine. You might feel okay while you're exercising, but when you're done, you crash or you crash the next day. Sometimes there's a delayed reaction. You exercise at five o'clock at night the day before, you feel great, you go to bed, you wake up the next day and all of your symptoms are flared up. You're running on a very limited amount of energy. And because of that, when you go over what your body can give you day to day, then it's almost like you have an energy debt that you have to pay off. And sometimes that doesn't happen until the next day. So if you have metronidazole toxicity and you're noticing these flare-ups, one of the reasons that that could be happening is maybe you're overexerting yourself physically the day before and then the next day you crash. Suicidal thoughts. I hate to say it, but this is a relatively common symptom of metronidazole toxicity. It has to do with the obsessive thoughts, not feeling like yourself, the brain fog, the anxiety, most of the neuropsychiatric symptoms. 
Most people can handle the other symptoms. They can handle them, but the anxiety is just so awful. The lack of sleep, the fatigue, all of it eventually gets to a lot of people. It got to me. I had suicidal thoughts about, uh, about six weeks after my initial reaction. If you are dealing with suicidal thoughts right now because of metronidazole toxicity, I want you to know that you're not alone. And also, right now, you're not yourself. Now, that person who you are is still there, though. They are still within you. It's just going to take them a little bit of time to find their footing again. In the meantime, you just you need to hold on. Just hold on. The suicidal thoughts will eventually go away. You just need to hang in there. Now we're going on to the third page, the third most common symptoms of metronidazole toxicity. And the first one on the list is one of the first symptoms I had when I had my initial reaction in June of 2015, and that was difficulty speaking, aka dysarthria. Difficulty speaking, a lot of times people think of slurred speech, and I actually did have that. I remember calling my mother to, to take me to the urgent treatment center, and, and when I called her up, it felt like my mouth was drunk. I was having a hard time getting out what I was trying to say. But in addition to that, as that day progressed, as I went from the urgent treatment center to the ER, my problems speaking got a lot worse. Instead of just having slurred speech, I also had a shortness of breath while speaking, with, which is also a part of dysarthria. And I was literally talking like this, trying to get up my name, trying to tell them what was wrong. My mother had to speak on my behalf for a lot of that because I couldn't get out more than maybe a sentence at a time until it eventually started to calm down. And you'll notice with metronidazole toxicity that the symptoms calm down and then they spike up and then they calm down again. In addition to those two symptoms of dysarthria, which is just a blanket term for difficulty speaking, you can also have poor coordination of phrasing and breath support, which is also part of that. Nasal sounding voice or speaking as if you have a cold breathy or quiet voice, harsh or uh, hoarse sounding voice, strained or strangled sounding voice, voice changes which are too high or too low, a monotone or flat sounding speech, or a slow rate of speech. So those are all related to dysarthria. And this is from the um, Wexner Medical Center of Ohio State. They're the ones who had made this uh, very clear definition, which I'm using right now, and I will link in the description below for you to take a look at. And it's possible that you didn't think that you had dysarthria. Now that you look at it, that's not just slurred speech, maybe you realize that you have it some too. Difficulty swallowing. So this one can be related to the sore throat, the, the dry mouth, the anxiety, but there's another factor involved with it that we'll talk about in the next video that, um, that explains why you might have difficulty swallowing. You might also have this strange sensation like you have a lump in the back of your throat that you cannot get rid of. And uh, you might notice that it's easier for you to swallow food and thick liquids as opposed to swallowing something like water. Shoulder and or back pain. So a lot of times the neck pain can radiate down to the shoulders in some individuals and then also some people have complained about having back pain as well. Excessive thirst. So even without an appetite, there have been reports of people just having this excessive thirst where they, they do want to drink a lot more than they normally would. A lot of people think it's related to the fact that they don't want to eat. Maybe, but there's, a, there's other factors involved. White tongue. Again, of all the random symptoms, basically what it is is where you have this, this white gunk that has coated your tongue and possibly the inside of your mouth. 
It could potentially be due to a candida overgrowth, which is yeast, and you might require to get some medications in order to get rid of that. Um, but there's other things involved when it comes to metronidazole toxicity that's related to the dry mouth, the problem with the dry mouth. Imbalance of electrolytes. This can be potassium, it can be sodium, it can actually also be minerals like magnesium. And sometimes it's very difficult to test for those types of things. With um, man magnesium in particular, most of your magnesium is not in your blood. Most of it is in your bones and your tissue. So you go to a conventional doctor and have a standard blood test for magnesium, unless you are really deficient, there's a good chance that nothing is going to show up abnormal because they're testing what's in your blood and not what's in your cells. So if you are deficient in magnesium and you don't have enough in your blood, your body will sap the magnesium from your bones and your tissue in order to keep the amount in your blood stable because you need that in your blood in order to regulate your heart. Without that, you, you die. So your body knows how important it is. So it's going to keep your blood level of magnesium good. It's much better for you to have a, a test like a whole uh, red blood cell test and check what's actually in the, the, the cell itself as opposed to what's in, what's in the blood for a magnesium test. Um, but things like potassium, my potassium was abnormally low when I went to the ER the first time and they didn't really have much of an explanation for why. Well, here's your explanation. Metronidazole toxicity can cause an imbalance of electrolytes and also a few other things. Long-term changes in taste and or smell. So this is one that is, is less common but can certainly happen and it might be that you have that prolonged metallic taste in your mouth but some people have reported that they just overall have a distortion in the way that things taste and a distortion in the way that things smell or that these sensations um, are, have been reduced, that they can't sense them as well as they used to. Changes in the appearance of urine. This is a very common side effect. It seems to be relatively benign. In a few individuals dealing with metronidazole toxicity afterwards, this symptom can sometimes linger and have that change in appearance of urine moving forward. I, I, we don't really know why there's not a really good explanation, not even on the FDA label, why this is happening. Excessive sweating or lack of sweating. Again, one extreme or the other. You notice that pattern going on here. Extreme sleepiness. It is possible that instead of having that horrible insomnia that you will instead just want to sleep all the time. And it is no better than the insomnia because no amount of sleep gives you the rest that you need in order to be fully awake the next day. When you wake up the next morning, what you pretty much want to do after that is to go back to sleep. And again, it goes back to that one extreme or the other scenario. While most people have the insomnia, there is a few select people who might have extreme sleepiness instead. Now we go to the less common symptoms of metronidazole toxicity. Involuntary rapid eye movement. So this is a motor control issue and you might notice if you look in the mirror that your irises are jittering back and forth. This can also possibly affect your vision. It might be uh, helping to cause your vision problems also. So you might wanna check in the mirror and see if you see anything. But for most people, this is not something that typically happens, or if it happens, it happened while they were on the drug and then it resolved itself. But it is a, a symptom of metronidazole toxicity, so you might want to take a look in the mirror and see. Memory loss. This goes beyond the brain fog. This goes beyond the forgetfulness, this, the, the cloudiness, the difficulty concentrating. Um, this is actual issues of, of not being able to, to piece things together. I have talked to a few people who they don't make a lot of sense. They, they are repeating themselves. They repeat their stories over and over again to me, not realizing it because their short-term memory has been compromised to some extent. This is a less common symptom. Most of the time people have the brain fog, but to go as far as memory loss, not just forgetfulness, but memory loss is a bit extreme. 
hallucinations. It's very possible, and what's more common is to have a vivid dream where you start to wake up and you think that you see something, but there are some people who do have hallucinations with metronidazole toxicity. Edema. Edema is swelling in the limbs, possibly the heart, and possibly the brain. And if you want to test for this for yourself, even though it is a less common symptom, take your thumb and any, if you think that your leg is swollen or your arm is swollen, and press down on the part of the limb that you believe is swollen and hold it for a couple of seconds and then lift your thumb up. For most people, there'll be a little white imprint on the skin, but that's it. The skin bounces back very quickly. If you have edema, that actual physical imprint will remain for a few seconds before it very slowly goes back to normal. That is a sign that you have the swelling. If you have swelling in your limbs, that doesn't necessarily mean you have it in your heart or your brain, but it is something that uh, you certainly, I would suggest seeing a medical doctor about because it, it could potentially be serious. POTS. We will go into what this means in the next video, but for now just know that it is a dizziness and or fainting upon standing due to the heart not properly regulating blood to the brain. Muscle atrophy. It is possible to have muscle wasting with metronidazole toxicity. It is a less common symptom. Most people don't have it, but metronidazole can directly affect the muscles. Burning, tingling, numbness throughout the entire body. So we went from the feet and hands, then we went to the face, then we went to the extremities. Now we're talking about it being potentially anywhere and everywhere, including the chest, stomach, back, head, it could potentially go to any part of the body. Enlarged heart. This has an explanation that does not have to do with anxiety. The anxiety does not cause an enlarged heart. But as we talked about on the first page of the more common symptoms, we talked about the heart palpitations and the pounding hard heartbeat. Your heart is overcompensating for some of the things that the metronidazole toxicity has done to the body. And I will discuss that in the next video when we really get into the medical literature behind these symptoms. Okay, so now we're on to the rare symptoms. Convulsive seizures is rare. If you're a physician listening to this right now, and you've looked at medical literature regarding metronidazole toxicity, you'll notice that it says seizures all over the place. Case studies of seizures, I am telling you right now, convulsive seizures are rare, and I'm going to explain in the next video why there's so much documentation on it in medical literature, and there are so few patients who actually have metronidazole toxicity reporting it in patient circles. Psychosis. A lot of times psychosis gets mixed in with anxiety, with the obsessive thoughts, the not feeling like yourself, even the suicidal thoughts. And there is a line there that's a little blurry, but ultimately psychosis is when you have a full break from reality. It's where you stop making any sense. It's where you don't understand what is going on around you. It, it is a total break where the, th the previous symptoms, um, while they're horrible, are more of an altered mental state, but not necessarily psychosis. Impaired vision. Most people with metronidazole toxicity where their vision is affected causes blurry vision. This goes beyond blurry vision. This is where the vision really is impaired. There's, there's definitely a severe visual compromise here. And um, unfortunately, this is listed in medical literature, and they don't go into any more details about what that means. Long-term disability due to collective symptoms. It happens. There are people in our support group who have long-term disability, some of them who are now on disability due to metronidazole toxicity. And usually their symptoms are so extreme that a couple of conventional medicine 
tests will actually be able to log them, actually be able to see what's going on. But that is uh, going on the very extreme side of things. It is rare, but it certainly happens. Now, the last three I put a little asterisk beside because uh, these symptoms occur while taking the medication or shortly thereafter, and that is liver toxicity, coma, and death. I don't know anyone, or I never heard any report, I should say, of somebody taking metronidazole, having a bad reaction to it, and then going home and dealing with the symptoms, and then a month later they die. What happens instead is that they start having some very serious metronidazole toxicity symptoms while they're on the drug and they're hospitalized. They slip into a coma and they die. And they could still be taking the drug at the time because the doctors are unaware that it's the metronidazole. But usually it's where they have already gone so far while they're taking the drug. They slip into a coma, they stop the drug, and then the person passes away. I don't know anybody or have heard of anybody, again, who goes home, even from the hospital, and still is having symptoms, but they're conscious, they're moving around, you know, you're doing some things, even if you feel horrible, and then all of a sudden you die. I've never heard of that. I'm not saying it's not possible, but I personally have not heard of, that, uh, of any reports of that scenario. So if you're off this drug, I don't think this is something that you would necessarily need to worry about. Now, before I go, I want to show you the list of symptoms that I had due to metronidazole toxicity and where I am today. Because while I am five years out and I am doing so much better than I was, I still have a couple of symptoms. I know that sounds really scary and I'm not meaning to scare you. Um, I'm happy. I am relatively healthy. When I had metronidazole toxicity in 2015, it felt like I had an angry lion lying on my chest, ready to rip my head off at any given moment. And now the metronidazole toxicity symptoms I still have from time to time, they're more like an obnoxious house cat. You know, yeah, you know, she rips up my curtains and pees on the carpet from time to time, but overall my house is doing okay. And that's how I feel about it. It's a nuisance. And if that's where I was in 2015, feeling as bad as I was, and this is where I am now, I actually feel really lucky. So here's the list of symptoms that I had of metronidazole toxicity in 2015, and then the list that I have today in May of 2020. These are my metronidazole toxicity symptoms with anxiety being probably the worst of all of them just because I did not feel like myself anymore. It was not my first symptom, ironically, but it was the worst symptom I had. Now there is one symptom I have to point out here and I will explain in a later video how this is possible. On the right side, I have ringing in the ears. That symptom I got at the end of 2017 during a flare-up of my metronidazole toxicity symptoms. And if you are a physician listening to this right now, believing that that's not possible, I can't possibly get another symptom of metronidazole toxicity two and a half years after I had my initial reaction. I hope that you continue listening to these videos because I'm going to explain how it is possible and it is actually a very common problem with metronidazole toxicity. So this is the list of my metronidazole toxicity symptoms as of today, May of 2020. Most of these symptoms I do not have very frequently. There are a couple on this list that can come on more often than others and there's one or two that can be that are a little consistent but overall most of these symptoms flare up only every once in a while fatigue is one that i might have a little bit more often than some of the other symptoms brain fog 
every once in a while I can get a little bit of a foggy brain and nothing feels like the brain fog of metronidazole toxicity other than metronidazole toxicity. And if you have this, you know what I mean. Difficulty breathing. I can still get a little bit of a shortness of breath from time to time. Um, it feels like a, sometimes it feels like there's a belt around my chest tightening around and like my chest wants to cave in. But overall, that sensation, which I had constantly throughout the rest of 2015 and into the first six months of 2016, that is mostly completely gone. Heart palpitations. I can get a little bit of heart palpitations from time to time, a little bit more of that hard heartbeat, but most of the time that stays dormant. Weakness in my legs, sometimes I can feel a little bit of weakness, a little bit of a, must, they feel a little bit jelly-like sometimes. Neck pain, the neck pain is more like neck sensitivity now. I mean, it just in fall of 2019, I went to Cedar Point and I rode roller coasters. And then the next day I had some mild neck pain and that was it. And if that's the extent of my neck pain, then, then I don't have a very big problem with it. Tremors, going back to what I said before that you have the physical tremors and sometimes you can feel like you can have internal tremors. Mine have gone from physical tremors to a little bit of internal tremors Every once in a while, I will feel this sensation, like my left arm and hand are just slightly unsteady. But that's the extent of it. Considering how much they were trembling in 2015, I'm, I'm fine with that. Muscle aches. I can get a little bit of muscle aches in my legs. Ringing in my ears. Unfortunately, this is a symptom that has lingered for me. Now, when it first happened, it was it was pretty bad. It just, it was all consuming. I just constantly heard it. It has toned down about 50% of what it was. And on top of that, I've gotten used to it. And if you do have ringing in your ears and you're afraid it's not going to go away, you will get used to it eventually. It's kind of like um, how your nose is always in your line of vision. Now that I've said something, you see your nose, right? Well, in a couple of minutes, your brain is going to forget that your nose is there again because it, it literally just tunes it out because it's not important. It's the same thing with the ringing in the ears. You get used to it. You tune it out. And lastly is heat intolerance. There were a lot of things that could trigger my metronidazole toxicity symptoms back in 2015, like physical exertion, hormones, stress, not sleeping enough, any of those things. But nowadays, the only thing that really seems to be able to trigger my symptoms to any consistency is heat intolerance. I typically have my toxicity symptoms more in the summertime than in the wintertime. That wraps up our video for today. I hope you found this information beneficial. And in the next video, Metronidazole Toxicity Symptoms Part 2, we are going to be looking at the reasons why these symptoms are happening, what they are doing to the body that's triggering them. We're going to take these symptoms and reorganize them into new categories based off of that information. Although we're not going to break them down the way that we did in this video, but we are going to show them in a different way. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.